So the title of tonight's message is Our Labor. And it has to do with obviously Labor Day, which just passed by. Very big holiday in America. Um, barbecues happen. People do all sorts of trips. It's the final hurrah. Beaches are rammed. Fairs are rammed. It's packed everywhere you go. But the point is, it's actually a day of labor. And just a little bit of historical background. I picked this picture you can see here. It's actually of women picking up sheaves after the harvest. So these are poor people in France. It's a real picture. Somebody drew it and then painted it in the 1800s. It's a great picture. But it depicts people laboring after for food. So in the United States and Canada, the first Monday of September is a federal holiday, Labor Day. Originally celebrated in New York City, Union Square on September 5th, 1882. It was not an official holiday yet. They're the first ones to do it. Labor Day was organized by unions as a rare day of rest of the overworked people during the, the Industrial Revolution. It was a creation of the labor movement and is dedicated to the social and economic achievements of American workers. Oh, it's not working yet. Let me do the click. Yay. This illustration is of the first Labor Day parade held on September 5th, 1882 in New York City. The holiday was organized by the Central Labor Union to exhibit the strength and spirit of the trade and labor organizations of the community and to host a festival of, for, for the workers and their families. Now again, this was the first time they did it. It wasn't a state holiday. These people actually took a day off. So some people had issues afterwards. But the point is, they realized we need to take a break. So um, there were also protests demanding fair wages, the end of child labor, and the right to organize into unions. Laborers at the time worked 10 to 12 hour shifts for six days a week. Children as young as 10 years old worked in coal mines and dangerous factories. So if you look closely, you see people wearing signs. Those signs aren't saying, yay, we have a day off. They're saying equal rights. They're saying no child labor, end child labor. So all these things were also, so it was no doubt it was a celebration, but it was also a protest to say, hey, we got some problems here. Again, today we have labor laws. Today you enjoy so much about America. You, when you get a job, you're thinking, I'm going to work 40 hours. They even had songs about it. Working nine to five. So they had a bunch of things back then, now, that you take for granted that folks before us did not have. So Labor Day did a lot of amazing things. But I want to actually give you a little bit of more history because I think it's a pretty interesting event that actually became Labor Day, or what triggered it. It wasn't beautiful. It was actually bloody. But in 18... It's not going to work today, is it? So in 1894, something amazing happened. The, there was a thing called the Pullman Strike. Now, Pullman was a company that made the train cabooses, not the big engines, but you know the, the part where people sit in, those are called the cabin cabooses, and then there are freights, the empty big you know, box cars, they called them. It was made by one company called Pullman. They were very powerful, very lucrative. So they made almost 90, to the majority of the cars on trains were by them. The engines were made by whoever, but the part that actually carried people and, and property and stuff, livestock, wheat, whatever, was made by Pullman. So they were a big company in America. And they had very, very, very strict rules for the business, because they were trying to make money. And in 1894, the owner, Mr. Pullman, actually reduced the wages by 30%, and also limited um, the amount of staff. So he laid people off. And he did this because he guaranteed his shareholders a 6% return on their investment. And to do that, he obviously had to squeeze it out of the employees. Now, the problem was that he created a town called um, Pullman in, 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 in Illinois, because back then the Midwest was like the juncture, because we were, we were building west. And at the time he's building this particular company, all the trains ran through the Midwest, most, mostly Chicago and St. Louis, Cincinnati, and obviously Illinois. And the point was, Pullman was a city he built, kind of like Disney World. He built his own city, he, bu he built the buildings, and he leased them out. So anybody who worked for him had to live in those houses he owned. Now, he leased everything out. That way, he always got money off of it. And, the, and, the, and just to give you a little background, the rent for, your fam for a typical family was $9 a week. Now, most people made $9.07 a week, the average worker. So, and your rent was taken out of your paycheck before you got it. So families were getting $0.07 cents a week to live on. 
families of five, families of seven. So this obviously caused tension because people are hungry. They can't buy food. Yet literally, your paycheck comes in and you get seven cents. So we can laugh and joke about it, but this happened every week. So at the end of a month, you'd have seven times four, 28 cents, some families. So the point is they obviously got disgruntled and they have what's called a wildcat strike, which means you don't plan it. You say, you know what, we're fed up, let's go. So the strike happens and in the strike, they start putting stuff on the tracks to stop the trains from running. Because they said, if you don't, and they, they try to negotiate with the, with the owner, saying, hey, bargain with us, you know, let's, let's figure this out. And he was like, nope. He actually closed his office, closed the, 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 his house, and left town. That's how serious he was. And of course, the other big rich folks were mad at him because they're like, you know, arbitrate, like, talk, discuss, figure it out. So it got so bad because it was, after May, they, they, they were fed up that it spread everywhere else. So other places that had train companies, Pullman sites, you know, Pullman's a company, they shut down too. And they were doing civil acts of disobedience. They were turning on trains, having them ram. This, these are actual drawings from actual newspapers. So this is not me making it up. This is actual drawings, if you look at the bottom, from actual newspapers. Again, this is 1800s. They didn't have photos like we have today. You drew everything. But as you can tell, they would turn trains on, have them ram other trains to destroy them. They would set box cars on fire. I'm talking about hundreds of box cars. So it was a very, you know, they, they again, you're making seven cents a week. So, so don't look at this and say this is hard. This is, you know, it's two, it's two sad situations. One person is being very greedy, the other people are just desperate. And even so, sometimes they would, they would derail trains on bridges. Because remember, they didn't have cars back then. To pull a train that heavy out of the water, you needed horses. So remember, this is the 1800s. This is not now, where you can just get, get a backhoe or crane lift. It was desperate times. And it got so bad that the president at the time Grover Cleveland sent in the National Guard and the Army to protect the railways because unfortunately these, some of these strikers, they were stopping the mail. And the mail is a big part of America, that's federal stuff and you can't um, box out that. The, the, the strikers agreed to let the mail carts through, but unfortunately the owner would mix mail carts in with regular trains. So when they derail a train, they derail a mail cart. So of course that of course affects federal stuff. And it got so bloody that on June 1894, there was a shootout, and 30 protesters or strikers died, and 57 of them were wounded. And six days later, Grover Cleveland signed into law, I guess through Congress, an act that allowed unions to form and also to have the strike stop. So, so and, it, and, and, and it wasn't until 40 years later, in 1938, after the Great Depression, that they signed into law labor laws like a work week is 40 hours. Children can't work under 14. Like all these things that we fought for, unions were not legal. It took 40 years after all this to happen to it finally to change. So today now, we have Labor Day today. So please just enjoy the fact that you can take time off. You have 401ks, health benefits, dental. I mean, these things today, we get you, you demand them now, but none of this existed. We have welfare, we have unemployment, we have a bunch of things that help poor people, help under, what's called underemployed uh, people. So you're underemployed. You're employed, but you don't make enough to pay for all your bills, so you're underemployed. All these things now, we have help for that. So be grateful that God allowed that to happen <laughs> because our country was harder to live in, and some of you would be working and wouldn't be sitting here right now if we lived in that time. But we're in 2000 now, and now Labor Day means the start of the NFL. <laughs> The start of college football, I'm pretty sure quite a few of you guys are in brackets and doing, and doing fantasy football and all that stuff. I have no time for that. God bless you who do that. And of course, for all you people who love to shop, there's a bunch of Labor Day sales. So today, <laughs> this is what Labor Day means today. It means sports, recreation, it means barbecuing, going to the beach, visiting family, et cetera, et cetera. Some of you probably got deals on your school outfits and all that, books and I don't know, but maybe you didn't. Either way, this is what Labor Day means today, but there's a lot of stuff that went into Labor Day that we should be grateful for. Again, God's promise allowed it to happen. This is why people call America one of the greatest nations, because we have the ability to get served even when you don't work. I know some people hate that, but some people can't work. Some people have harder times working. Some of us are blessed to have strong minds and strong bodies. Others aren't. So we've got to be careful when we push away some of these benefits, calling people lazy when some people just can't work. You know, again, people do take care of the system, but that's part of the human nature. You can't throw them out and keep them in. 
It's either them and them or neither of them. So that's my two seconds spiel on that. Now we're going to get to the word. So I didn't bring you all here to talk about labor too much. I came to talk to you about our labor as Christians. So focusing us back now on the word of God and seeing what God did through labor here in America, but more particularly for you, the Christian, what does our labor mean to God? What does it mean for us to labor as Christians? So to do that, I'll let to turn to the book of Revelations and just look at one verse tonight, verse, four, ver, verse 13 in chapter 14. So if you have a Bible, please take a look at chapter 14, verse 13 of the book of Revelations. And the, again, the title message is just simply our labor. And look at this verse, hopefully you see that in the book of Revelations, the apostle John, who's in a dream, is seeing a bunch of things. And we're at the point in his dream where he re or vision in the book of Revelation where this is before the seven bowls of wrath are being poured out. This is before the great dragon, the devil, is dealt with. So God is about to do an awesome thing and say something very powerful here to you, the Christian. So if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian here tonight, this should be a message of encouragement to you. But if you're not, this should be a message of understanding of what's waiting for you if you don't have this. So turn on your ears and your eyes and let's see what's going on here. So Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, the word of God says this. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. Now if you look here, I want to highlight just a section of scripture here that says, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. And there's our word, labor. So we see here the Lord speaking, and he says, say this, blessed are those who die from now on. And this happened 2,000 some odd years ago, which means this is us. This is to you, the Christian. Yes, you're alive, but it says here those who die in the Lord are blessed because they will rest from their labor, and their deeds will follow them. So I want to figure out, though, what does it mean, labor? Like, how many people here have been in labor? I mean, I'm not a woman. My wife was in labor recently. I just had a baby. She had physical labor. So I, are they talking about labor from a baby? Are they talking about, like, mowing lawns? Are they talking about doing your homework? Are they talking about doing your chores? What kind of labor is the scriptures talking about here, and what are we resting from? I mean, everybody goes to sleep at night. Hopefully, you have a nice, comfy bed. You know, you sleep well. You put on your PJs, brush your teeth. You know, pray. So we all do get rest. But it says here, particularly, they will rest from their labor. They implies those people whom God who are in Christ, and it's their labor, your physical labor. So what were you laboring in? What's the Bible talking about here? Is it talking about babies, chores? I think to find the answer, because this is the last book of the Bible. This is the end. I think we have to go to the beginning. So let's take a quick look at the book of Genesis to see what exactly is this labor it's talking about. What is this labor that all of us are in? So if you go to the book of Revelations, we're in the Garden of Eden. This is after Eve and Adam have sinned, and God has already spoken to Eve and the serpent, and now he's coming to speak to Adam. And in verse 3 of Genesis, starting as just simply, sorry, verse 17, chapter 3, the word of God gives us an insight to what exactly this labor is. Let's take a look at it right now. Chapter 3, verse 17, the word of God says, To Adam, he said, Because you have listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. And you see there, I'm just highlighting real quick, it says, through your painful toil. Toil is work. That's labor. So this is a bondage everybody who's born of Adam is under. This is the labor we have. Cursed is the ground, and we will labor, we will toil in it, we will do that kind of work until we return back to the dust. So everybody has this penalty. Nobody is born that doesn't have to pay this price. All of us toil for what we eat. Everybody works to eat. 
don't work, you don't eat. You know that. This is, this, even though it's America, we got soup kitchens. We got a bunch of ways to get coupons. We got a ways, many groupons. We got many ways to get food for free, but somebody has to work. But more importantly, we have to not, we, because we didn't rely on God for our food, our truth, our justice, our, our, our peace, we now have to labor, we have to toil, we have to work. And more importantly, there's a penalty for this work, which is sin. Because we disobeyed God, as Adam disobeyed God, and we are the children of Adam, we all have to labor, we all have to toil. Now, I'm not just pulling this out of thin air. Those of you who were here last week, I preached a message using the book of Ecclesiastes. It was called, there's a season or there's a time for everything. Now, there's a question in chapter one of Ecclesiastes that asks, I think the most important question all of us should think about. If you, if you can just watch the screen of this one, Ecclesiastes chapter, th chapter one, verse three. Just a review for you folks that were here last year. It said, last week, it said, what does man gain from all his labor and which, sorry, at which he toils under the sun? And just to focus here, it says, all of his labor at which he toils, he spins, he does. If you have a garden, you gotta go out there and work it. You don't just throw seed in the ground and walk away. You gotta, you gotta turn the soil, create rows, you know, put out grubs and you know, fence it in. There's a bunch of things you gotta do to, to make sure it works. That's part of the labor, it's a toil, a uh, figuring out. And it asks this big question up front. What does a man gain or a woman from all this labor? And the answer, if, you, if you've read the next verse, it's nothing, it's meaningless. Or it says vanity, it's vain. It's, 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 it doesn't yield anything worthwhile. But, so what does it all mean? What's the purpose of, of, of life? If, if we, we all labor, we're all cursed to labor, we're all cursed to toil. And we find the answer in the last chapter and the last verse of the book of Ecclesiastes, like, just like last week. So this is more of a quick succession. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, we find the answer of what's the purpose of life? What's the purpose of all this work? And it says here in chapter 12, verse 13, now all, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And if you look here, it says, fear God and keep his commandments. This is what we have to do as Christians. This is where Adam failed. He did not fear God. Because when his wife came to him and said, eat this fruit, he knew where it was from. Because it said, she ate of the fruit and gave to Adam, who was with him. He was not down the block, make a left, make a right. He was right there. And he knew what happened. He did not fear God. He feared his wife. He didn't want to disappoint her. She must have been beautiful. She must have been funny. She must have been all the things that it took for him not to fear God. And because of that, he fell. And it says here, that same rule that God gave to Adam, we still have to keep that. We still have to fear him. We still have to keep his commandments. And what are the commandments? Every word that comes out of God's mouth. When God took Adam and said to him, Adam, you have to toil this land, have, have authority over it, and tend to it. That was a law given to him. When God spoke that, it was truth, it was, it was power, it was, it, was his, it was just as strong, if not stronger than the Ten Commandments. Because when God speaks, whatever he says is truth. Amen? So it's not like I'm just saying this just to scare you. I'm just saying whenever the Lord speaks and it's written down in black and white, pay attention. And Adam didn't do that. And likewise, some of us don't do that. So don't just look at us and point to Adam. All of us are still in Adam. We all have to make sure that we do it says fear God and keep his commandments. But even further, it says, for this is the whole duty of man. This is why God created Adam. If Adam kept, feared the Lord and kept his commandments, we wouldn't be here right now. We'd be eating fruit and living forever and enjoying it. But thanks be to God, he did not leave us in our broken state laboring, knowing that the penalty of sin is death. He gave us freedom. He gave us a way out. And Christ becomes that person that can fulfill this. So all those who are in Christ are doing things unto the Lord and not unto themselves. We'll get into that in a minute. So, what we talked about in the, our verse, remember it says, blessed are those who die in the Lord for their labor, for they will find rest. And the question becomes, where did this rest come from? I mean, did God just make it up? 
at some point, God must have instituted rest for his people. And I believe that the place where he gave the initial rest for his people in the Old Testament, which is Israel, is found in, in um, Exodus. It's, <clears throat> it's found when we have this thing called the Sabbath or the rest day. When the Sabbath came, God gave them rest, mandated rest. People already were already sleeping, but God ordained this specially for his people. Again, this is Israel he's talking about. So if you look at this, we see the observance of the Sabbath came at a particular time in the history of Israel. And to find that time, we're going to look at the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, which is exit, Exodus, is when the people of God are leaving bondage in Israel, uh, I'm sorry, bondage in Egypt, and all of Israel is moving. They're in the wilderness. And God is doing an amazing thing here in, in, in Exodus chapter 16. He's feeding them. He's feeding them. And while he's feeding them, he creates this thing called the Sabbath. And he just created, he institutes it, he makes it a law. Not just if it's a good idea. And again, people already slept at night, but he carved out a special day of rest. And watch what he does. So Exodus chapter 16, verses 21 through 30, it's a big piece of scripture, so I'm going to read it from my notes here. I'm not going to put it on the slide, but just pay attention to the Bible and just hear it out. Starting at verse 21, the word of God says, each morning, everyone gathered as much as needed. Again, this is God giving them manna, which is um, wafers that taste like honey from heaven. As much as he needed. And when the sun grew hot, it melted away. So the manna didn't stay. When the sun hit it, it was out of here. You had to gather it quickly and take care of it and keep it for the whole day. Verse 22. On the sixth, sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two comers, two omers, which is about four quarts for each person, and the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until the morning. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Each it, sorry, eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Every morning, God would rain down manna from the sky. They'd pick it up off the ground in baskets and eat it. But on the Sabbath day, he says there's no manna from heaven, no bread coming from heaven. Um, uh, on the ground today, uh, nevertheless, he, verse 27, nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Now God said, stay home and show out and eat what you have left over. And they didn't listen. Hard-headed. Verse 28, then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you, will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. So hopefully you see here that God, to his covenant people, instituted a day of rest. And he called it holy. It wasn't just a regular day. It was a special day that God himself spoke upon it. So understand, whatever you did that day was double blessed, I think. It was extra blessed because God said on this day, chill out, relax, love on your children, love on your wife, you know, don't do work. Just take me and read Psalms, sing, hear a sermon, do something that's going to bless you because I'm giving a special day of my attention to you on this day. And some folks said, eh, God, I don't care. I'd rather just do my own thing. And when God tells you to rest, you better rest. You don't want to wrestle with God. You lose. So, now this particular rest or Sabbath day that was instituted in Exodus 16, later on was put into stone. Well, into tablets. And hopefully you know what this is. So, in Exodus chapter 20, we see God takes what he started with the manna and makes it an actual law. And it's looking at verse... Uh, 8 through 11 in Exodus chapter 20 the word of God says in verse 8 remember the Sabbath and that's the fifth uh, commandment in case you wonder which one it is it's that one right there 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep, by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So we see here that God had his people work for six days. They picked that manna, they walked, they, they, they shopped, they sold, old, you know, they, they did what they had to do. Baked bread, boiled the manna, it was just manna for manna, manna for manna, manna for manna, manna for manna. It was manna for everything. It was manna ice cream, manna sandwiches, Manna Tootsie, it was manna all things. And later on, they actually grumble about that. But the point is, God said on the seventh day, it's sacred, it's holy. And he's trying to create a picture here of how he treats his people and what he plans for his people. They shall work for a long period of time, but at the end, they shall rest because he says to rest. And he provides the rest. So I just want you to get a picture in your head that in the Old Testament, God sets up this, this, this image of the people he loves. And he supplies them what they need every day, on time. But on the seventh day, on the Sabbath day, he says, stop, chill, and just take me in. I'll supply you what you need. I gave you enough the next day to eat, but take, open your spiritual ears, open your spiritual eyes, see me, hear me, connect with me. Because I wish to talk to you, I wish to meet with you. I'm setting an appointment with you. I love you, I wanna talk to you, I wanna commune with you. And he says this through his Sabbath day, his rest day. But he does a bigger thing in Christ. So those of you that are Christians, there's a bigger blessing in the Sabbath in Christ than there was in Moses. Because we have a full Sabbath now. But I'll explain this way in a minute. But still, six days of work though. Not six days of slumber, not six days of laziness, six days of work. So there's a, there's a person in the Old Testament, I wish to just give you an example, who understood what labor is. Because the people of Israel, God's beloved people, they're hard-headed. They don't get it. But one man got it. And he's an Old Testament prophet by the name of Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet that above, above prophets because he wrote the most. He had like, what, 60-some-odd chapters of his book. And he dealt with the most grumblingest, most fumblingest, most messing up parts of Israel. Jeremiah dealt with them afterwards. But the issue with Israel that Isaiah had, they were thick-headed. They never got it. And he has something to say about labor because he dealt with them so hard and for so long. And time after time, trial after trial, situation after situation, they kept making God angry. And see here, after all these years, well, and this is, this is chapter 49 we're going to look at, verses 3 through 4. So this is not even the end yet. This is chapter 49. He has about 20 more chapters to go, or 15 or something. So let's take a look at verse, chapter 49, verse 3 and 4. Just two verses. Here's what Isaiah, God says to Isaiah in verse 3. God said, the Lord said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. God's saying, I love y'all. And because of you and through you, I'm going to show my works, my amazingness to everybody. But, you know, Isaiah has a response. He goes, but I said, Isaiah says, I strength, sorry, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand. And my reward is with my God. And I hope you see that. He points out that his labor was pointless. He labored in vain. He, he came to the people. He spoke. A, a prophet speaks to God, to, to, to the people, represents God to the people. So whenever you want to hear from God, you got a prophet. You ask him a question. He went to God, spoke to God, came back with the answer. That was the purpose of a prophet. A priest represents the people to God. So a priest doesn't, hence the sacrifices. So if you have a sin you want to get atoned for, you go to a priest, you, you, you confess your sin, he goes, gets an animal, cuts it, and he atones for you to God. So a priest hears from God and speaks to the people. So a prophet hears from God and speaks to the people. A priest represents the people to God. Isaiah wasn't a priest. He was a prophet. And he said, everything you tell me to tell them, I tell them. And they don't do it. And he's so frustrated, but he turns the corner. And I don't know if you see that word there. He says, yet. He doesn't get frustrated in ministry. 
He doesn't say, God, nobody's coming to my ministry. I come, I prepare, I do all this stuff, and nobody, I, I tell them the truth, and I look out and I see two people. Or we go out and evangelize, I, I say hi, I give out, I put on my best outfit, my best smile, I pray a lot, and I go, and I, people keep pushing the tracks out of my hand, and my friends don't listen to me, and, and he says, yet, yet, which means I'm not going to look at that and focus on that. What is my due is in the Lord's hands, and my reward is with my God. So he's saying, even though I labored in vain, I preached, I explained, I exhorted, I, I, I admonished them. I know that my God has me. He sees what I do. I'm doing the work of an evangelist, a laborer. Even though what I said falls on deaf ears, my Lord still has my purpose. He has me. I don't have to worry about what they think. I should love the blood. The, the blood. Remember, he's talking about fellow believers. He's not talking about un, people who are ungodly. He's talking about God's choice. He, he saw the verse before. You are my servant, whom I'm going to pray with my, Israel. He's talking about the whole body. He says, you are my servant. He goes, Isaiah represents the whole body of Israel to him because he speaks through him. So when he talks to Isaiah, he's talking to everybody. Just like with Moses. Moses was also a prophet. A prophet. So when the people messed up, who did, who did God say? He said, Moses, why don't you keep my commandments? He's like, hey! But, the, the, but, 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 the. and no. He's also a priest. He represents the people to God. So understand we're all one body. If one of us is sinning, all of us have to work on that. Loving that brother, loving that sister. Don't say, so glad I'm not that brother. That's not Christian. All of us have to, we're, we're the church here, this local body here. So if you don't care for each other and make sure if one of us is in trouble, all of us are in trouble. The Bible says to weep with those who weep, mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice. That means that if one of us hits the lotto, all of us hit the lotto. Not literally, figuratively. If one of us has a baby, all of us have a baby. I'm so blessed to be in this church because my daughter is everybody's daughter, apparently. And I love that. They, I, I, can, I can leave her with the body and walk away and come back 10 minutes later and she's okay. This is the kind of thing that Isaiah had to deal with, though. He dealt with the other side of that. But understand that when you do things unto the Lord, even if it's in vain, with your eyeballs, your God will bless you. Your, your life is in his hands. Whether you have a thousand people believe or nobody believe, whether you give out tracts and everybody comes and nobody comes, your God trusts his, he, he gave his trust to Christ and Christ is yours because you trusted him. And, and, and remember, Christ belongs to the Father, so you belong to the Father. And the Spirit of God is in you. So all this God is all over you, if you, if you live by sight and not knowing what, what, what Isaiah knows and say to yourself, what is my due? What is due me is in my Lord's hands. I do the work that God has put before you to do work. Whether it's blessed or it's coming out horrible, I still trust him. The best person that said this the best was Job. Though you slay me, I will trust you. That means, he, and mind you, Job lost 10 kids in one day. All of his workers that he loved, his homes, his crops, his animals. That's horrible. And he sat there with sores on his body, scraping them with a pot, saying, though you slay me, I will trust you. And God was like, mm, love that Job. And some of us look at Job and say, dude, glad it was Job and not me. And I'm saying, Christian, be careful. Because the Lord might do just such a thing to you one day. And when you turn around and curse him and say, well, you treat me so good in the beginning, what's up now? And God's like, really, I changed? You think I've changed? And God be careful. So moving on, I think as a character though, even though I think that Isaiah understood what labor was, there's a guy I think was a labor king. And here it is. I think he was a labor king. The person who I believe was the king of, oh, not the king of the king, that's Jesus. But when it came to labor, I believe, in my opinion, he was the labor monster. It is our beloved brother, the Apostle Paul. And I believe the Apostle Paul gives us great vision, great understanding, great encouragement on what it means to labor. So I'm going to look at three epistles he wrote. I'm going to just put up the, the, the scriptures and read them here because for the sake of time. But I want you to listen what Paul says to these particular people about labor. Remember, Paul's the one that labored. He's the one that did this work of going around 
town to town, village to village, city to city, hamlet to hamlet, talking about Jesus. And this is what he had to say. So starting at his first letter to the churches in Ephesus, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, the word of God says this, or Brother Paul says this, for, I'm starting at verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Remember that. If you're a Christian, you are created to do good works. Not evil ones. Not devious ones. You cannot be in the light and both in the dark. That is not the life of a Christian. So remember that. If you are a Christian, you're created to do good works. What are good works? We'll talk about that afterwards. So, good works. Oh, sorry, remember that. To do good works. I lost my spot. I happen to get excited. All right. So that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So if God calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light, and you are a Christian and you believe in him and trust in him, he has good works already lined up for you. The question comes, do you accept your assignment or not? Do you step into your destiny in Christ that's already written? The outcome's already heaven. That's the outcome. You know the end result. The question is, will you walk the line? Will you step into whatever God has called you to step into, whatever that is? And reminds you, if you're a Christian, you have gifts. Some of us have a lot. Some of us have a little. But whatever he gives to you, do it all unto him. Spend it all. I believe I've given the gift of preaching and teaching and exhorting and counseling. And I've run from the pulpit for many years. So don't look at me as a guy who ran, I'm 40. And I'm just doing this now, like two years, three years ago. So I was ducking and dodging, but God was gracious to me. So don't spend your youth running from God like I did. Please, please, consider the things you can do. Oh, but I'm young. Timothy, Titus, I can go down. Some other people, you want me to name some other folks that were young, that were young people? Don't act like youth is a problem. Youth is not the problem. Fear is the problem. Fear is the problem. And the only thing you should fear is the Lord. Not men, not jobs, not schools, the Lord. So that's one letter. The second letter I think that helps us is a church, is a letter to the churches in Philippi. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. In this particular letter, he's writing to the people in the Philippi. This is his first, I think, or second plan. So he loves these people. He put a lot of time into them. So let's look at Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 12. The word of God says, Therefore, my dear friends, that's an awesome introduction, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Remember that, good do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. Remember, you're evangelizing. You give out the word of life. Repent. Repeat. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's drawn near. Believe. That's the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing in vain. So Paul's writing them, the people he spent all this time with, saying, hey, beloved, bro, sis, how you doing? Love you guys. I've heard so much about you. But stay focused. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't get too puffed up. Don't believe you're stronger than what you are. Lean on him. Whittle yourself down. Don't make yourself too strong. Learn it. Read. Get the word in you. But don't get above the word. We're all underneath the word of God. That's our compass. That's our mantle. We stand beneath Christ. Not above him. Not in front of him. Beneath him. He's our Lord. We look up to him. God. Yahweh. Big, all these names he has. Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Rapha. There's so many ways we could call him. But at the end of the day, we call him. We call him. So, the final letter in this short trilogy is 
the, 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 first, the church, the letter to the churches in Thessaloniki. The first, first Thessalonians chapter three. Now this is a bit of a rough church. These folks were a little hard-headed, a little thick-headed, so he had to make sure, because they had a lot of nonsense going on. He was a little tougher on this church. But check out what he says, chapter one, ver, sorry, chapter three, verse four and six, the word of God says this. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted and it turned out that way, as you all well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and, your, our, and our efforts might have been useless. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought us good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you have always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. So you see here, Paul is always concerned about his people. The places, the things he's labored in, he minds his labor, he takes care. Now, mind you, he's being persecuted. And if you read more, he, he says we were saved out of the mouth of the lion. And he runs down a laundry list of being flogged this many times, stoned, imprisoned, beaten, scourged, which means ripped his clothes off with skin-ripping whips. Horrible stuff. But in the midst of all that, does he say, send me some money. Come and get me out. Help. He says, no. How are you guys doing? I'm worried about you. So in the midst of problems, in the midst of trouble, Christian, don't think that you are bigger than those things that you're laboring in. If God puts you in the mission field, that's where he puts you. If you got the flu, work it out. If you got a problem at home, work it out. You're on a mission. God has given you an assignment. Stop making complaints. He said it up front here in the scriptures. We told you that we were going to be persecuted, and it's come to pass. We live in America. The times are changing. And the persecution, I believe, everybody believes is coming. Don't get caught off guard. There's a saying I used to grow up with. Always be ready so you never have to get ready. Always be ready. Don't hold stuff tightly. Put my house, put my car, put my job, put my family. God says all these things will pass away. Trust me. If he is truly God, then whatever he's taken, he's going to give you more than that uh, in spiritual, in, 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 again, in heavenly places. Not stuff, more of him. Now, I'm not saying this to say that if your dad or mom or job goes away, you shouldn't mourn. But know that God isn't asleep while that's happening. He's not like, oh, what, what? Who? She? How, how, what happened to her? What? Hold on. Let me, let, let, let me get my pants on real quick. I'm, I'm take, that's not our God. That's not our God. He's always aware. He's always available. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. So when you go through trials, and you will, and tribulations, and you must, do not lose hope. And whatever mission field, and whatever you're laboring in, do not derelict it. Don't leave it. Don't just jump into the city. I, I don't have time. I don't have time. Make time. Paul is getting, he's probably in prison when he wrote this. With whelps on him, and beaten up, and probably looks at his from all the beatings he's got, and his only pain is, oh, these people are falling away. Have they not gotten it yet? Because when he was there, he was struggling with them. He was struggling with them. That's why he said his, his best man, Timothy. He didn't stand on Islamists. He didn't send Titus. He said Timothy. That was his ace. That was his, that was, that was his, his money shot. If anybody could do it right, that man could. And he's a half Jew. Full Christian, though. So I'm just letting you know that if Paul, in his time of persecution, can stop and not think about himself and say, hey, Timothy, I know we're getting whooped on right now, but I need you to go over there and make sure they're all right. And some of us say, but, but our labor, our labor. So not to end it on a humdrum, I'm going to end it on a high note. I want to go to the last letter I will look at that Paul wrote, and I believe this is Paul's greatest encouragement. Paul gives us the best encouragement here for our labor, our labor. Remember, the question in the beginning was, what is our labor? It says our, uh, that, that we will rest from our labor and our deeds will follow us. What are those deeds? We don't, we, we've kind of figured out labor at this point, amen? So let's move to the deeds. Like, What are the deeds about? What's going on with that? 
So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 through 38. 53 through 58. Let's check out what the Word of God has to say. Starting at verse 53. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortal. Sorry, with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, the commandments, and all the other laws. Sin in us crushes us because God has not spoken his, his word, his truth, his law. And not sin, this is all Romans, seeing opportunity uses the law to crush us. But thanks be to God, Jesus came and overcame the law and fulfilled the law. That's why us Christians don't have to worry about death because our Lord has conquered death. So this statement right here for you Christian, it, it's not invalid, it's fulfilled. It's taken care of. We have somebody who covered it for us. And this is why our labors mean something. Otherwise, our labors mean nothing because nobody in here can overcome the law, can fulfill the law. And because the law exists, sin crushes you. The penalty of sin is now death. But Christ said, uh-uh, I paid for him. I paid for her. I paid for you. I paid for you. I paid for you. And he paid for me. So never, ever forget that. Death is not something we fear. Paul said it best. To die means to be with Christ. And some of us are afraid to die. And some of you are young, but, what, but understand this. Death is promised to everybody. Nobody's immune to that. The difference with a Christian is we know what happens afterwards. We know that when our eyes open, the first face we'll see is our glorious king. And everybody else wonders, what if? We don't wonder. We just look at the Bible, read it, and say, okay, got it. Trust you. Let's go. So, verse 57. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That deserves an amen. Woo. 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let me see that here. Let me try it again. It says here, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Why? Because, that means that there's a reason for, you know, you don't guess, you don't think, you know. Why do you know? Because he said it. If you are, if those people who are called by my name repent, and turn and seek me, they will find. I will heal you. I will, if you are in a moment of tragedy, a moment of terror, call upon me. I will rescue you. He's not a liar. Because people get caught up in that part, the because part. Uh, I think, uh, maybe, you have to know this. If Christ is a liar, then his death means nothing to you. You have to believe his word. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Leave implies he's with you. Forsake your minds. Do you know him? Nope. Don't know him. Never been in my life. Don't know who he is. Never saw him. Nope. Don't know her. Uh, that's not our Lord. That's forsaking. He will see you say, come, come. This is our God. And then finally, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is why we do works unto the Lord. Remember what he said earlier. These are good works. These aren't kind of okay works. These aren't all right works. If he prepared them for you before you existed, and he's a good and holy and righteous and just God, then why would he put you in stuff that's okay? Even if all you're doing is Sunday school, or checking people under the desk, or greeting people, or ushering, or doing evangelism, or going on missions. Whatever you're doing, however big or small, that is your assignment. That's where he's placed you. And do it with all your might all your heart and all your strength. He is watching and he smiles when he sees you do it with passion and you're focused. You're not trying to do a hundred 
I'm here to do my God's will. I'm in a play. I'm, 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 in, I'm in ministry of worship. Uh, I'm in AV. I'm in whatever I'm in. And I'm doing it to the excellence of my Lord. I don't care if you're going to go and click slides for ours or for the big church. Big church you better pray before you do that because you're doing it to the Lord. If you're going to be doing sound, pray before you do that. Get together with your fellow and pray. Make sure you do it. Until, don't come in there carnally with flesh. Like, this is easy. I do this all the time. Twink, 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 twink. And that's not, how is that glorious? You're prideful. You're boastful. Calm yourself down. You're about to hear from your king. He's about to breathe on you his words. And you're coming in there arrogant like, you know, this is all right. You know. I was thinking, I got to get the game starts. In the two. Really? The game. Or I got to go to this. I gotta, you are coming to hear from the king. The same voice you will only hear for the rest of your existence after he comes back. And you're acting like this is temporal. And I'm not doing jabs. I'm just saying be mindful of this. If you're in a group of people say, hey, 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 sis, hey, bro, stop, stop. We're doing the Lord's work right here. We need to be serious. We need to humble. Don't come in here with your chest. No, humble yourself. He is king. I think we don't have kings. We need to have kings again, I think. That'll help us understand that. You don't talk to kings like you talk to your buddy. He's a king. So, getting back to our main verse. So, wrapping this all up. Our main verse again was, Then they heard a voice from heaven say, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. I want you to notice a couple of things here. I already said blessed before. But who says yes? The Spirit. So Christ is the one that pays for you, redeems you, and washes you. We already know that God, Christ sent the comforter from the, from the Gospel of John to be with us and in us because we're not holy temples. He dwells in our physical bodies. But he also says amen because it's his job to keep you until Christ returns. And he speaks up here and says, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. How will that happen? The spirit of God is in you. He's the one that empowers you. He's the one that makes sure you're able to keep doing these things. Because sometimes you do ministry and you're like, I don't know how I got through that today. I was this, I was that, I was this. A bunch of things. And you have to understand that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Your sin is not bigger than him. He is God. He dwells in you. He resides in you. And he's speaking to you right now saying, they, that's you, insert your name, will rest from they, insert there, insert your name, labor for their, insert your name, deeds, will follow them, insert your name. And who's saying that? The Holy Spirit of God. He is not a, 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 a vapor. He's a person. He's the one in Genesis 1, 2 that hovered over the nothingness. The Spirit of God hovered over the nothingness. He's the one that brought to life all the things. Christ spoke it, but he brought it. They all have a part to play. And that power, that amazing God, is inside you. And he says to you, I got you. When you get there, I will present you. Here's your sister. Here's your daughter. Here's your son. Because he's a comforter. He cannot fail. His job was to testify to Christ. So, <coughs> the kingdom of God. When you get there, you will rest from your labor. And all your labor will not be in vain. Your works will follow you. And the scroll of life, the book of life, your name, you'll look up and see your name written. And the king will open the door and receive you with open arms. Because he saw you and you trusted him. And it will say those words that we all want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come into the paradise that was prepared for you before you existed. And you will sing hallelujah and say amen. So hopefully today you learn about our labor. And it's not in vain. And wherever our Lord decides to put you, please make sure you do excellence. Trust him. He is faithful. Hopefully this message encourages you to, if you're not in some kind of labor, seek the Lord on that in prayer. You shouldn't be an idle Christian hanging out just doing you. He saved you that you might do great works and good works because he prepared them for you. That's why he saved you. Because the good works you do are his good works and you get to bless him. And the prayers you send up, if you read Revelation chapter 7 and 8, they go into a bowl and he pours out those prayers. 
and those prayers go up in a flame and just beautify and edify our God. So don't be afraid to talk to him, but most importantly, he is faithful. I gotta keep saying that because he is not what the world makes him out to be. He is God. He'll do everything he says he'll do and do it abundantly and amazingly for those who love him. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you that we have labor. But the labor we have is no longer the labor unto death. It's the labor unto life. We have the opportunity now to bless you, to showcase that you are truly our God and we are truly your people. We thank you that all these things are done to glorify you in heaven, but that you give us peace, hope, mercy, grace, and you give us back a heart of flesh. Let us not be carnal Christians and hide. We know that you are the only wise God and you see all things. We trust you in all that we do. We ask you to bless our final worship and our final fellowship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church.